Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I am Natalie Bennett, uh, Director of UIC's Women's Leadership and Resource Center and the Campus Advocacy Network Program. It is my pleasure and indeed it's actually an honor to introduce Dr. Jaquita Collins to you today. So Dr. Jaquita Collins is currently Vice President for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion and Chief Diversity Officer at University of Texas Health in San Antonio, where she's also Associate Professor of Research in the Department of Population Health Sciences in the Joe and Teresa Lozano Long School of Medicine. Much of uh, the information uh, in uh, Dr. Collins's bio can be found on the website, so I won't share that information, instead I'll share something else. Trained as a sociologist, Dr. Collins is a valued and critical voice in conversations around the role of racism as a social determinant of health, and is co-author of one of the most highly cited articles about healthcare disparities written in the United States. In addition to her foundational work on race and social epidemiology, Dr. Collins actively champions diversity, equity, and inclusion at the local, regional, and national levels from partnering with San Antonio's high schools to serving as chair of the Association of American Colleges Group on Diversity and Inclusion to working with Time's Up Healthcare. Today's talk will speak to her leadership work. Dr. Collins's path to transformative leadership in academic medicine actually started here in Chicago. She earned her undergraduate degree from the University of Illinois at Chicago and her master's and doctorate degrees in sociology from the University of Michigan. She has been the recipient of numerous prestigious awards and was recently a fellow of the Hedwig van Ameringen Executive Leadership in Academic Medicine program at Drexel University. Prior to joining UT Health San Antonio, Dr. Collins served as the Associate Dean of Diversity and Com Cultural Competency and Assistant Professor of Medicine at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Today's lecture is co-sponsored by the College of Applied Health Sciences, the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Health Affairs, the Department of Sociology, and the Honors College. I want all of you to join me in welcoming our Women's History Month keynote speaker, Dr. Chiquita Collins. Well, thank you, Dr. Bennett, for such a warm welcome. I am honored and humbled to return to my alma mater, and I'm just thrilled to be with all of you today. And so I have been charged to provide a keynote as pertains to our commemoration of Women's Health, I'm sorry, Women's History Month, which is every March. And I will share with you some pearls as well as um, looking forward to an opportunity to engage in conversation with questions and suggestions, recommendations, and really capitalizing on this opportunity to have um, engagement. And so before I begin in terms of showing my slides, in fact, let's do that first. All right, can you see it on your end, Dr. Gupta? Awesome, okay. I think it's important for us um, who have the privilege to be in leadership to share some aspects of our narratives, our lived experiences, because we often find that we, in terms of the many accolades and accomplishments one may acquire during the course of their career, we're unaware in terms of their journey. And I think it's, it's, it's pertinent and critical for us to, to offer that, especially when we're talking about um, communities that are often disenfranchised, women, underrepresented faculty, marginalized and vulnerable communities. And so as was mentioned at the onset, I am a native of Chicago. Um, I'm the only gypsy in the family because my family still resides for the most part in the city or in the neighboring outskirts. But I tell you, I've had the privilege of having opportunity to engage with individuals from all walks of life, 
I grew up in the Old Town area, which is in, well, at that time in close proximity to the notorious uh, infamous housing project Cabrini Green. But I also had access to vast privilege in terms of the Gold Coast and the near North side. So my parents are, I'm first generation college student. And so my parents did not pursue a college education, but they knew the value of education and that it would be a key and opportunity for us to achieve great heights. And so I pursued an undergraduate degree at UIC. My junior year, I was a major in biology and because I've always had interest in health and medicine. However, not knowing the expectation and the commitment needed to really do well in terms of uh, college as a full-time job, I had a full-time job in addition to having a full course workload. And so I took it upon myself to take a leave of absence. And so I went home and I shared the information with my parents and they were not very uh, supportive, of course, but I'm grateful that um, the response wasn't um, more, um, I would say harsh, but it took me a semester to recalibrate. And I went back and it was, you know, oftentimes those who start off in STEM fields by default, um, we do well in electives. And so it was a toss between sociology and psychology. So the rest is history, right? I decided to pursue sociology and I had phenomenal mentors who saw potential in me that I didn't see within myself. And they encouraged me to pursue graduate school. I did take graduate level classes as an undergrad and I excelled in those classes. And so I had very strong reference letters. I applied to three schools, only one made it into the mailbox. And that was the University of Michigan by which I was bestowed a merit scholarship for my graduate training. And so through that, I just think again, it's imperative that we share our lived experiences and our journeys because it's not always straight and narrow, right? Failure is part of success. And so I am beyond blessed and fortunate to be where I am today. But I tell you that journey influenced me in terms of becoming uh, what I am today in terms of uh, Chief Diversity Officer and all the many things that was shared in the intro. So with that, I'll begin. I wonder if I have to reshare because it's not turning the page. And I'm not sure what's happening. There we are. Okay. It's great to have some guidelines in the course of the presentation itself. I'll try to stick to it, but oftentimes, you know, sometimes you are kind of uh, improvised based on conversation and what might be uh, materialized in the chat room itself, although I know we have Q&A at the very end. So I'm going to present to you today issues as it pertains to concerns, challenges, and barriers by which women face in pursuing leadership and our efforts to achieve equity across the board. I think it's important for us to introduce the concept, which I know you're not um, familiar with, the concept of intersectionality. And last but not least, I like to empower our attendees and our participants today in terms of directing um, all of you to viable to tools and resources in which you can become um, empowered and really either by way of individual um, aspirations or ways in which you can contribute to changing the culture of one's institution. Okay. So given that I am a diversity officer for an academic health center, it's important to kind of demonstrate some of the tenets that we um, try to uh, adapt and adhere to in our, in our work. And so I really lean on the Association of American Medical Colleges because they are the somewhat um, flagship organization um, that um, actually is um, consists of all 
medical schools, teaching hospitals and medical societies and really um, ensuring that we meet our mission, our tripartite mission as pertains to provision of patient care, research and education. So the five that are listed here is really to increase access to high quality healthcare services. The second tenet in terms of the importance of diversity in medicine is to broaden our medical research agenda. Third is to advance cultural competence or cultural humility. And number four, and we've kind of moved beyond this um, connotation of utilizing diversity because diversity sometimes has negative connotations. And so we ascribe to really pr the promotion of institutional excellence or inclusive excellence. And last but not least, we have to ensure that we're teaching the next generation of medical students and um, physician scientists, and, and as well as basic sciences as well, that we incorporate in our curriculum ways in which we can advance diversity, equity, inclusion, as well as restorative justice. So um, why is diversity important? Um, and let me just share with you that oftentimes we try to put everything but the kitchen sink and how we define diversity, right? Whether we're talking about race, ethnicity, gender identity, gender, and other types of ways in which one might self-identify. But for the purposes of this presentation today, we'll really focus on race, ethnicity, gender identity, and gender, okay? But know that there are many. And given that I'm trained as a social demographer, we tend to look at trends as pertains to population change. And as you can see from the slide here, um, it, it, it actually illustrates three separate time points by which um, it demonstrates the degree to which you will have access to someone who's different than yourself, okay? So this is pretty much um, compilation in terms of, as it pertains to African-Americans and whites, but of course we have growing um, uh, subgroups that have contributed to the diversity in our country today. So again, I'm not ignoring or negating the fact that that is the uh, reality. All right, so you see in the southeast section of the country back in the 1960s is where you saw um, the prevalence of the tendency by which, you know, there was a large portion of African Americans who resided in, in those states. And that's why you see that um, clustering in 1960. In 2010, we see where it is spreading out across the uh, United States primarily on the Eastern quarter and on the West Coast and in some sections in terms of the Southwest in addition to the Southeast. Now, um, this is largely related to the growth of the Hispanic, Latino and Latinx population as well as the Asian American population. But you see again, that it tends to be a distribution across the states with some exceptions in terms of the midsection. What demographers are projecting in 2060 is that you're gonna see even more of a greater propensity of individuals interacting with others who are different from themselves as it pertains to um, uh, race and ethnicity, okay? Two groups that are driving this growth, as I mentioned on um, my earlier slide, are Latinos, Hispanics, and Latinx and Asian Americans broadly defined. Of course, it does not take into consideration the granularity or the heterogeneity that exists between those two groups, but nonetheless, it makes the point that they're contributing to the diversity as we see um, illustrated back in 2010, roughly representing 32%, and that has been projected in 2050 to increase to 54%. Now, what is the value of diversity? And so, there are many studies in the literature and in research to document that diversity is equated to success, to innovation. Okay. And um, the business industry or private industry has done a better job in illustrating that relationship. Okay. Now, if there's anything that you walk away from today, know that women, I repeat, women are the main factors or contributors to uh, innovation and collective intelligence, okay? This was reported by the Harvard Business Review in terms of your team, the likelihood, or I should say, if you have more women on your team, 
in producing research and innovation, the greater likelihood that you'll be producing scholarship in flagship journals um, has been documented in the research as one um, example. Okay. Now, although they're no longer with the National Institutes of Health, Dr. Hannah Valentine recently um, resigned and retired as, and similar to uh, the director, Dr. Francis Collins, they wrote a seminal um, commentary, a piece to really illustrate the uh, evidence that has supported um, this relationship. So this is just um, for, um, uh, to bring to your attention. Now, we've done well in some regards, okay? Back in 2017, we reached gender parity as pertains to women matriculating in our medical schools across the country, including uh, some uh, aspects in Canada as well as uh, Puerto Rico, okay? Which is great, right? Um, and although this slide illustrates 40%, we've actually reached parity in terms of 50% or higher, okay? Two reports that were published by the Association of American Medical Colleges, one came out in 2015, which really um, documented the trends um, from a time period between 2013 and 2014. Well, they re, um, I would say, um, updated um, that data and came out with a report in 2000, I believe 2019, to illustrate if there had been any differences or any growth as pertains to women moving up the ranks in terms of academic ranks, um, in addition to fulfilling uh, various leadership positions, okay? And I'll share some data with you as we go along the course of this presentation, okay? Here's a fact. Overall, women make up only 36% of physicians in the United States, okay? What we have yet to reach is gender parity as pertains to senior leadership, okay? So I'm gonna talk to some degree about women in leadership and yes, it's more pertain to um, medicine and health, but nonetheless, it really illustrates the point here, okay? Recent data has shown that roughly 30% um, of all senior leadership positions are held by women. However, when we really pin down in terms of the C-suite, you know, those who are CFOs, CEOs, uh, CDOs, uh, anything that begins with a letter chief, that number is quite uh, much smaller. Only 13% of those C-suite positions are held by women. Now, just to give you a visual depiction in terms of, um, and I try to keep track of women who have been named um, deans or within decanal uh, positions, deans of medical schools, that is. And, oh, I'm jumping the gun here, sorry. It's important to look at granular data, right? Granular as pertains to um, various uh, specific racial and ethnic groups because it tells a different narrative, right? And so we've been pushing for academic uh, medical centers to do so. And what we find is that those differences in terms of those who are leading as deans across uh, medical schools, those numbers are even smaller, only 18% um, in terms of the overall uh, uh, women who are representing. Um, we have over 155 accredited medical schools in the country, but they only represent 18% that are um, actually in deans positions, okay, leading the academic uh, medical uh, center. As it pertains to African-American women, they only represent 2% of all deanships. And I'm only saying those who are deans of medical schools because there's different uh, deans of uh, various offices that are contributing to um, the mission of academic health centers. But I am just talking about those who are in positions that oversee um, effort in terms of managing and operations of academic health centers or medical schools, 2%. Now here's a visual that I would like to share with you. And this does not represent the 18% that's quoted here in the slide here, but it represents in terms of who has been recently named deans of medical schools. And I know most of them, um, but nonetheless, it's great to see that we've made tremendous progress in women becoming uh, deans or in leadership positions, right? So um, exciting news. However, when you look at this depiction, 
I see something that does not necessarily mirror or represent the diversity that exists in our country. Believe it or not, there's only been one Latina, one Latina who has reached the pinnacle of being a dean of a medical school in this country. She recently stepped down and now she's the executive vice president at the University of California Health, but she was the first Hispanic or Latina woman um, at the uh, Texas A&M is where she held uh, that position, Dr. Kiri Byington, okay? Women in leadership as it pertains to health systems, which is a different entity separate from um, medical schools, but they tend to have oversight over the management of um, hospitals largely. Dr. Redonda Miller uh, is at my former institution at Johns Hopkins Hospital. She became the 11th president and the first woman to ever hold that position. And Johns Hopkins Medicine was founded in 1889. She secured this position roughly, I'm trying to remember, in 2016. Okay. Here are some examples of other uh, women that represent the uh, diversity that exists, who also hold positions in uh, senior leadership and health systems. One person in particular, Dr. Paula Johnson, who is now the 14th president of Wellesley College. She's an MD and she received her training and she was very influential at Harvard Medical School and became the executive director for um, the, the women's health and uh, gender biology. So she is um, somewhat unique um, to become president of a all women's college, but her background is in medicine. Okay. Now, this is somewhat, you know, this is based on a paper that came out by Nina Shore in terms of women representing of all deans, 16%, which is what I've already shared. And sometimes you see the percentages ranging from 16 to 18%. A scholar and physician at the University of Michigan, Rashma Jack Jaxi, um, she has produced a series of scholarship to really um, highlight and illuminate um, the extent to which gender equity and issues related to the gender gap is quite, uh, still remains and is quite prevalent. And so I will direct you to her work for further investigation. Now I'm gonna show you a cartoon and I wonder if um, this particular situation resonates with either experience you may have had or you may have observed, okay, being a woman. And I know we may have men in the audience, but so just bear with me. And this is the topic of implicit bias, right? And so what the cartoon shows is that there's a woman sitting around a board room table, right? And she is the only woman sitting there. And the caption reads, um, that's an excellent suggestion, Ms. Triggs. Uh, perhaps one of the men would like to make it. Have you been in that situation in which sometimes you may have offered a contribution and someone else may have uh, rephrased it, but it, it's essentially it's the same comment or uh, contribution you've made. And that person is given credit and you're not given credit for it. I mean, if I was in a room, we were sitting in a room together and I would ask for a show of hands, I'm sure everyone sitting in that room will probably raise their hand, okay? So we tend to accept ideas, perspectives, um, be influenced by individuals that we hold commonalities with, right? There's many biases, and this is just one, which is referenced or referred to as affinity bias. But this is a common challenge that women face, even though they have may, may have reached the pinnacle of uh, executive leadership, okay? Now, if you're not familiar with Brittany Cooper, I would highly recommend that you um, peruse her work um, she is a, I'm trying to remember if she, she's a social scientist and she's written several books and one of which is called Eloquent Rage, A Black Feminist Discovers Her Superpower. And we actually had her um, come and speak to one of our conferences at the AAMC. And what's what is unique is that women of color have to deal with different types of challenges and barriers that our white counterparts don't necessarily experience. And if we display a certain 
behavior that is condoned as being, um, if you're voicing an opinion, um, the way in which you use your tone, inflection, uh, can be perceived as being aggressive or um, being, you know, the negative terminology that I can't say, you know, angry black woman, but then there's a, a, a synonym for that, right? So there are challenges again, by which not all women encounter. And so I bring up the concept of intersectionality, right? And currently we, we even use this term where we um, imply that individuals who have multiple identities fall into this um, categorization. But the reality is that we, off, we have to understand the root of the, of, the, of the word itself and who coined the term, okay? Now, as I mentioned, we throw in various identities, but oftentimes we don't include aspects of privilege or the power dynamic or oppressive sense, uh, systems that um, prevent or discriminate uh, uh, certain groups from gaining access to opportunity or the degree of marginal, marginalization. So Dr. Uh, or actually she's a legal scholar, Kimberly Crenshaw is the uh, individual who coined the term back in the 1980s, really to reflect the extent to which black women um, experience the double jeopardy, sexism and racism. And so that has evolved over time, but we cannot, we have to remember the roots of uh, uh, the origins of the uh, word itself and what it implied. So I am glad to report that the AAMC, for example, is understanding the need for us to examine uh, differences across um, subgroups within these large congregate um, populations. And so when I was sharing with you the extent to which women have made inroads, but looking at more granular data, we see that, again, there are distinct differences. Now, here you see a slide to illustrate the degree to which women are um, leads in or chairs of departments. So in medical schools, we divide it into clinical departments versus basic science departments. And so what you see here is that um, we still find where the majority of whom are led by white women, um, whether we're talking about basic science or clinical science. And you see the distribution as it applies to Asian, Black, Latina, and those who might be um, multiracial or biracial. So those numbers range from two to 11% when you combine the two um, types of departments. And so the reality is that we have to make sure that we do our due diligence in really investing and committing to efforts as it pertains to leadership development to ensure that if we are in the business of diversifying leadership, there are given opportunities to do so. And we'll talk more about that as well. So I showed you the um, uh, likelihood or the, the current um, uh, deans in which have been extended uh, opportunity to become deans of medical schools. You know, we only have four, four schools, three of which are accredited. One is not accredited by the LCME and that if, if, if we want to explore that more, we can during Q&A. But there are only four women who are of African-American descent who actually lead schools of medical schools uh, as deans. Okay? And as I alluded to early on, they only represent 2% of all deans in the country. Dr. Renee, excuse me, Dr. Carmen Renee Green, um, she snagged uh, the deanship back in October of last year. Dr. Deborah Diaz, she's at UC Riverside. She's been there for a while. Dr. Um, Digna For Forbes is the interim dean at Meharry. And Dr. Deborah Prothal -Sith, Sith is the dean of Charles um, R. Drew University in California. Okay. All right. So I want to step back and delve into ways in which um, we can think about the recruitment, promotion, and retention of faculty. And so I will 
I will put it in generalized terms as it pertains to race, but there are things that are quite uh, pertinent to um, the recruitment, retention, and promotion of women as well. Okay. Now, um, for medical schools, we have um, accreditation processes by which it is an 18 month endeavor, quite laborious. It involves all offices as pertains to the maintenance of our tripartite mission. Um, but in order to um, be accredited, or in order to have a medical school, I should say, you must be accredited, okay? And so there are standards by which um, it's um, earmarked for diversity effort. And so I've been very involved in that, res in that respect. Um, there is the, um, we also train students after they graduate, they become residents or fellows, which they get to hone their skills in terms of the specialty in which they pursue. And um, there's also efforts to rev up our diversity efforts from the governing body that offers or provides accreditation to graduate medical education. And so last year, they developed a equity matters um, agenda, which is really to um, put traction into becoming anti-racist organizations and institutions. And it's very progressive in that regard. So it's just really kicked off last year. And so it'll be of importance to see the fruition of um, those efforts across the board. Looking at faculty uh, um, within the School of Medicine, similar to what I showed as it pertains to leadership, we have work to do, right? The numbers are still relatively small when you start differentiating um, across or within racial and ethnic uh, lines, okay? 64% are roughly held by white individuals and then you see the distribution of Hispanic, Latino, Latinx, 3.2%, African-Americans, 3.6%, and American Indian and Alaska Native with only 0.2%. Many strategies that we can adopt to really um, rev up our energies. And I'm not gonna go into great detail about the many things in which we do here um, at our institution, but the reality is that um, everyone wants to, um, I would say, aim for a certain percentage in terms of metrics but that's only um, one aspect of the um, ways in which we uh, really, if we're serious about uh, our commitment to diversity and inclusion. And so um, we also have to be cognizant that if we don't enrich the pipeline, uh, students um, who then become residents and fellows, and then they may go off to private practice um, and not necessarily have interest in academic medicine per se, we're going to remain where we are unless we really put our teeth into investing in, in uh, prospective students at younger ages, as well as seeing um, investing in their success across the continuum. There have been many creative and innovative ways that have been introduced to us, mainly coming from uh, the traditional ac academia. Um, in, in terms of engaging in cluster hiring. And so uh, we're trying to adopt similar um, approaches to that. We have to ensure that um, in our language, in our, in our manuals, in our guidelines, that we articulate that we go beyond the EELC statement in trying to identify and attract qualified candidates. And, and let me tell you, individuals who represent uh, marginalized communities or underrepresented in medicine and health, they can read through the veneers. So if you reach the pinnacle of being, I would say, highly qualified and become marketable, every institution in the country is trying to buy and, and get your, um, solicit your interest in applying to their position. So if you have five in the country and you have 155 academic medical schools, there is a dilemma here. And so again, we have to find ways to replenish the pipeline to ensure that we all can have uh, uh, excellent candidates to fulfill our vacancies. The way in which we advertise positions are important. We have to utilize, um, I would say outlets that are not necessarily in flagship journals um, I can share with you again when we have our Q&A &A or in our engagement that oftentimes you have to meet people in terms of where they are. 
And you may have to um, actually um, engage in repeated, I would say repeated effort or a combination of different approaches. Because listen, to my point earlier, if there are several universities that are vying your, uh, for your talent, you really have to do your due diligence and be authentic in your messaging and the recruitment of underrepresented faculty. There is an approach uh, in terms of implementation and to ensure that it's sustained over time, sustainability, right? If we haven't learned anything from COVID-19 is to practice more grace and humility. Um, I encourage, you know, as it pertains to the recruitment of talent that we have a unified approach. Um, diversity cannot be successful. We work um, in silos. We have to collaborate and leverage um, across the board. We have to be consistent in our messaging and be transparent as well. These are some strategies um, that I try to adopt um, because again, diversity doesn't matter unless you measure it and you have to be mission driven. And a variety of different approaches that um, you have to engage in as pertains to um, diversifying your uh, constituent um, base. I'm shifting gears now because again, although I made mention of becoming an anti-racist institutional organization, um, there are tenets by which we have to ensure that we um, be mindful of, because when we think about racism, oftentimes we think about interpersonal interactions and someone may have done something that is um, overt or covert. Um, but again, um, we have to ensure that we take into consideration um, other types of dimensions of racism as well. And this was drawn from Dr. Kamara Jones in her seminal piece that was published uh, 22 years ago in the American Journal of Public Health. So my job, you know, and even the constraints um, working at a public institution that we sometimes encounter is how do we begin to dismantle, dismantle the systemic forms, historic, historic forms of racism that perpetuates and impacts the inability to um, recruit, promote, and retain uh, faculty. And so um, there have been some novel approaches and sometimes um, events in our society have to occur in order for institutions to wake up. And so post um, May 25th, 2020, many institutions are now recognizing the value of being more um, diligent in addressing and becoming a anti-racist organization. You cannot become one overnight. There is a process and although students um, tend to believe differently that when there is a concern, a challenge or issue by which um, they've been impacted, you know, many believe, and I've been a student before too, that it should take no time to resolve. But, you know, uh, academia sometimes our pace is slower than one would like, but nonetheless, we have to make sure that we have buy-in from leadership, we go through a process, we get approval, and we get everyone to have an opportunity to contribute. And so this is just a diagram that we often follow, but again, there's a I would say a process that's in place, but um, many universities are just beginning to understand the value in, in utilizing um, such approach. Dr. Abraham Kendi is um, quite famous in the promotion of anti-racist uh, organizations. And um, I love the quote by him, by the only way to undo racism is to consistently identify and describe it and then dismantle it. So we are engaged in educational awareness, creating empowerment workshops and the like um, to have a better understanding in terms of how do we actually begin to peel the onion and get to um, the place in which we would like to become in, 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 in being an anti-racist um, organization. All right, so I'm going to now revert back to the issues that are pertinent to women, faculty in particular. Um, Intersectionality is not just the cross section of race, ethnicity, and gender or gender identity, but it takes into consideration all the ugly is isms that exist in our society, um, both historically and some who that be have become um, still prevalent in our uh, day to day. What intersectionality is not, I think, is important to illustrate. It is not a code word for diversity. Okay. 
It's not about adding one aspect of identity to another, overlapping identities um, that really demonstrate the dynamics of power um, differences. Intersectionality is not a replacement for anti-racist education or thought. In fact, it complements it. And last but not least, it is not solely an American phenomenon. In fact, we have clear examples that illustrate that um, other places around the world um, experience similar uh, realities as well. Although this is not a sociology class per se, but you know, again, we have to be cognizant. What um, we've yet to really delve into, at least in medicine and health, is the issue of um, colorism. Um, and so again, we are, I'm just honored to um, have the opportunity because it's rare to find a social scientist in leadership. In fact, there's only two of us um, to bring to the attention of how do we begin to really um, expand our vocabulary, understand the roots of how these things impact um, individuals and communities and, and our patient population. All right, the national pay gap for women we know that um, on average, we make women make 80 cents to the dollar of what our male count, counterparts make. However, when we start looking at more granular differences, black women earn 63 cents to the dollar compared to their white male count, counterparts. And I apologize, and I should have had a slide in terms of looking at other groups as well. Um, and it's my understanding, you know, Latinas um, are in close, um, are neck to neck as pertains to um, uh, what black women earn in this country. What we are experiencing, if we don't really begin to be committed to the investment of women faculty, as well as women of color faculty in medicine and health, we're going to experience um, an exodus. You may have heard of the great resignation that has taken place because of COVID-19. And all industries are being impacted by this phenomenon. So health and medicine are also included. There was this commentary by Dr. Uche Blackstock, and you may have seen her on national news outlets because she decided to actually take a leap of faith. Well, not necessarily the faith. She came to the realization that she could no longer um, deal with the frustration and challenges and barriers that um, a woman of color like herself, an African-American woman in the context of academic medicine. And there are very, uh, a variety of different challenges and barriers as you see here illustrated here. And this is just a few that have been documented in the research. The extent to which you feel isolation, you feel devalued, you feel ignored, invisible, the imposter syndrome, the diversity, minority cultural attacks, whenever there's a committee in which they're looking for diverse perspective or they have a committee only focusing on diversity issues, they sometimes it's assumed just because you are a given nationality or ethnicity that you would um, fulfill that role. It takes away from your ability to focus entirely on your clinical care or if you're engaged in research, however, you're not credited in terms of when you go up for promotion, it is considered service. And you know where service lies as it pertains to academic promotion, very little. There is racial battle fatigue in terms of you're constantly having to fight uh, various issues and it wears on you psychologically. There is a revolving door, very, we may be able to recruit talent, but are we able to retain talent? The extent to which there is stereotype threat, you begin to internalize the negativity and the, um, I would say, condescending perceptions that are placed upon a group of a uh, certain racial, ethnic, and gender group. And last but not least, you know, you feel like, you know, they've hired one and so they met a quota. And so you feel um, as if you are a token in the um, grand scheme of things. Okay. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time, but we can as pertains to our engagement, you know, intersectionality, as well as the extent to which we're exposed to microaggressions, micro insults and macro insults. And so again, we're trying to 
disaggregate and have a better understanding in terms of how those things are common day uh, routine practice. And I'll share with you what we've done here at uh, my home institution to, again, mitigate those tendencies um, to empower individuals, but also to hold institutions accountable, right? Sometimes we always say, well, it's how you deal with it, your attitude, or you should just walk away and just turn a blind eye and, you know, just get through it and get your degree and move on. But um, you may have seen where microaggressions are like a mosquito bite. You know, one is quite irritating, but just think if you've been by a mosquito on a daily basis, right? And so that adds up in terms of cumulative um, stress related to exposure to discrimination, sexism, and all the other types of um, ways in which one is um, seen as invisible and the like. So I'd like to engage in what, what can we do? We talk about the issues, we talk about the problems, we talk about the concerns and barriers, but what can we do both individually and as an institution? Okay. It's always great, and sometimes this can be um, created in terms of utilizing a um, well-versed facilitator, you know, engaging in self-reflection. Sometimes we have to look within ourselves and how we're contributing to the maintenance of uh, a, I would say, unequal system, right? And so we try to start out there, do some self-reflection first and foremost, right? Just important. It's also great to um, take an intersectional approach in terms of how do we take stock in our data. Again, we don't know the full extent to which one issue can be a problem if we don't necessarily collect the data and, and find ways to um, have a more concerted effort to address those um, shortcomings. We can be an advocate. I'm really, this is pertaining to men um, um, serving as a sponsor or an advocate or ally or those who are not necessarily part of a marginalized group, whether we're talking about LGBTQA plus and how others can uh, intervene on your behalf, right? Or um, being a sponsor in which you are, um, someone's having a conversation about your qualifications without you knowing, you know, so they are advocating on your behalf, whereas a mentor is advocating or actually directing you in terms of what's best as you pursue success in your prospective career. I like this graph here because it talks about men being advocates for women, right? And these are some examples. This is not completely comprehensive, but again, provide some concrete ways in which they can um, engage in being an ally, right? So I made mention about have metrics, have accountability. How do you incentivize? How did you um, actually intervene on behalf of not only of, of a woman, but you know, when you're in circles of men and when they say condescending things, so you take the opportunity to stop them in their tracks and redirect them or to really provide information as pertains to inappropriate behavior. We created two cool um, two toolkits that is by the um, in partnership with the WMC that really focus on uh, women of color. There is one that is pertained to um, individual ways to empower oneself. And then there's another one that is pertained to um, uh, how do we inform institutions and becoming more um, actively involved in being and held accountable. Okay. Webinars have been produced in the last year and a half, and you see those illustrated here in the slide, again, to um, really amplify the importance of, of disaggregating um, issues as pertains to women of color. These are the two here. And if interested, I can direct you as publicly and freely accessible um, for anyone to um, gain access. Last but not least, encouraging women to take advantage of leadership development programs, whether they're offered through your home institution or elsewhere. And so I have been um, fortunate to participate in four and each one has been distinctly uh, different. Uh, but again, it adds to your repertoire um, and learning um, some pearls of wisdom and if you have aspirations of becoming a leader. So highly recommended.
Here's a nice picture of my cohort um, through the executive leadership in academic medicine, referred to as ELAM, hosted by Drexel University. We were the 25th cohort a couple of years ago. And as you can tell, um, it's quite diverse and most of whom are MDs, but there are a couple of folks who are social scientists as well as public health um, and, and um, dentists. So I will end it there um, and look forward to our engagement in terms of a fruitful conversation um, with you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Collins. Um, while we wait for a second uh, for people to share their questions. Um, and I hope that people have questions. I certainly have a lot of questions, uh, some of which we will probably um, take us far off topic. Uh, but while I wait for folks to come up with questions, I wanted to go back to the earliest point in your in your presentation where you talked about uh, 2017 being the year that um, where there was gender parity of women in medical schools. Mm -hmm. um, and you talked about um, the need to kind of use intersectional frameworks to think about women in medicine. So I want to kind of bring those two things together and ask um, what does the data say about women of color who are getting into medical schools and who are graduating from medical schools? Excellent question. So um, the data reports that we've made progress in increasing the number of matriculants over time and entering and graduating medical school. I'm sorry, I don't know the numbers offhand. However, because they, they group all women in terms right. of the gender parity. Um, but I do know this, that um, even when we talk about um, higher education in general, uh, women have made tremendous progress. In fact, you look at our classrooms, we have more women students than we have male students. And that's also, um, that, that, that also is mirrored in uh, medical schools. In fact, there is um, effort, even at the National Academy, how do we actually um, approve um, efforts to recruit our black men in, in medical schools? And so um, to your point, I, I think, um, again, we've put more energy in terms of leadership and faculty than we have in terms of our students, you know, um, but that will be of interest to kind of uh, investigate, you know, um, so I think, you know, again, we're looking at the overall picture and not necessarily um, disaggregating that information as we've done for faculty and leadership, but excellent question. Um, any other questions from the audience? Questions or comments are welcome. I just, um, my name is Hala Akbarnia. I just wanted to comment on that. Uh, thank you so much for that talk. Just my own background, I'm an ER physician myself. Um, I'm also now in the, um, a student at UIC in the MPH program. So it's great pulling in kind of this experience of the last two years into this program. And also um, just, you know, obviously being more involved um, in, as, a, as a woman in these positions, you know, has been eye-opening in some ways. I was on track to being a program director for my residency program in emergency medicine, but I, I was listening to what you're saying. And sometimes you feel that guilt when you when you pull off track because of various reasons, you know, like family or um, just different career um, aspirations. And I also feel like I do appreciate that your talk did not put down that um, aspect, meaning didn't make people feel guilty, which is, I think, a huge thing as well, because I have listened to other conversations which have have said, you know, made you feel like maybe I should have just continued to go um, the direction I was. So I do appreciate how you presented your material today. But thank you for that. You know, um, we, unfortunately, we still find incidents where uh, women are dissuaded uh, to pursue certain specialties because they assume that you can't balance. I hate that word. I'm sorry. You can't integrate your career. And if you have the desire 
to start a family or, or you may have a family, et cetera. The reality is that we have to ensure that we provide um, not accommodations, but resources for them to be successful, right? And we find that women, once we are given the opportunity and have the support um, to um, strike, you know, a balance uh, between those two worlds, then we are successful. And when we see more women becoming leaders, we find that um, policies begin to change to be more accommodating to um, those vast experiences that women often bring to the table. So it should not be where we are discouraging women to pursue surgery, for example. We just know that um, women have to have the resources in order to be in the support in order to be successful. And when, again, we see more congruency, when we see others who've been able to achieve um, levels of success. And so my point being is that we can do it if we're really committed to it. I think that's a great, great way of looking at it too, because even looking back to my own residency when I was doing emergency medicine and then becoming an attending in my own program, I was one of few women at the time in emergency medicine in, in that program. And I had my, I had a child then, which I was uh, the, the first person to have to experience that. So I found myself pumping in patient rooms, you know, and there was no established room to do those things. And it wasn't even something that anyone had thought of. And so even at that level, it's, it's interesting to see how we've grown in so many different places and how I look at med students now and residents now and how they have those opportunities that because, you know, more and more women had to experience it to say this is necessary. Um, so I, I think that, uh, I think, I think we're slowly getting there. We're slowly getting there, lactation rooms and child care provision. Some, although it's a, they say is an expensive endeavor to have it um, in house, you know, on, on the, um, campus um, itself. Um, but again, I mean, we have so many other kind of, you know, options, you know, care.com, you know, it, you know, so again, um, there are opportunities, we just have to make sure we explore them, and to, to um, secure those that are going to meet the needs of our women faculty. Thank you for that. To add also, I added in the chat earlier, there's uh, our, the, the medical educate, the Dean of Medical Education over at University of Chicago is Vinny Aurora. And she, uh, she's done some amazing things. I'm part of a group with her called Impact. And we've done quite a lot during this um, pandemic to take um, vaccines into a lot of different areas in the city. But Vinny uh, apparently is making another announcement tomorrow with a, another associate dean that um, is a person of color as well, a female. So that's great too. No, she's fantastic. So she has a national reputation and she's doing some wonderful things. In fact, I think they uh, initiated a women's symposium, uh, annual symposium. So uh, I know her very well. So yes, right. thank you for acknowledging that. Mm -hmm. Thanks for your question, Hale. Um, Another question that came in concerns uh, climate surveys, and I suspect this is relative to your, um, your points that you're making about how um, people of color and how women of color experience the academic medicine. Uh, so the question is, what do you think are the key challenges and risks to using climate surveys to taking stock of um, the experiences of women of color? Um, in, in medicine? And what strategies might you suggest to overcome those challenges? So that's just one approach to kind of um, assess the pulse of the community. And we ask specific questions that are pertinent to um, underrepresented groups. Um, but I would say you have to also complement that effort in opportunity for people to engage in, they call them either listening sessions or focus groups where they can come together and be amongst others who share certain commonalities and some people feel more at ease in that respect. 
last but not least, um, how do you become actively involved? And from the perspective of employees or staff, they have something called employee resource groups, which they are like the kind of advisories to a larger governing body by which they can bring to the attention concerns and issues in a systematic way. Um, so that has some utility. Um, for medical schools in particular, sometimes we have diversity cabinets that represent maybe senior executive leadership or diversity um, advisory councils, which we had in the School of Medicine, but it represented a cross section of different constituent groups. So again, um, you have to find ways in which you can voice and not always problems, concerns, or issues, but identifying some successes as well is equally important because um, unfortunately, sometimes the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing and people began to pursue uh, different effort that is not necessarily um, within a given office, which is fine, but you have to, um, you have to know what's going on. And so that requires an environmental scan to find out where the, or a slot analysis, where the weaknesses and strengths are in a given entity, whether we're talking about department or school or office. So it's a combination of all those things. I would say, you know, we can't just rely on one approach. It has to be multifaceted so that we can be informed as possible on how we began to um, create programmatic initiatives that really meets the needs of our um, constituent groups and when we are trying to um, really ensure a welcoming um, environment where everyone have a sense of belongingness um, and people feel um, respected and valued and feel like an asset versus, you know, um, you know, um, not necessarily, you know, being a contributing um, factor to the success of the organization. Hey, is it okay if I ask you a question? Yes, certainly, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Now, I saw earlier in your presentation that about uh, 60, and, and I'll just talk about where I come from first. I'm from UIC, um, and I'm, I'm part of a scholar group that seeks to put African Americans into uh, professional tracks, as in going to a graduate school, post undergraduate. And I am just gonna ask this question. I noticed that, the percentage of, uh, I believe it was body uh, of medical doctors that made up the system was 63% white. Is that correct? I, I saw that a little earlier. Yes, exactly. In terms of faculty, the overall oh. depiction, yes, 63%. Oh, okay. Now, my question, my question for you is, what do you think is the reason why that much percentage of medical doctors are white. Is it, do you think there's any particular reason for it is my question. I don't think it's one particular reason. Again, I think uh, what the studies have shown is that when we develop pipeline programs, that means you know creating partnerships with either high schools or, or colleges and universities or post baccalaureate programs that give them greater access to you know, being admitted to medical school, et cetera. Um, that we have to really start at much younger ages. They say that third grade is the critical time by which students become interested in STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, and medicine. And after that time, you know, you kind of lose them. But you also have to recognize that um, combination of things, the caliber of the education, how teachers view our children who come from underrepresented communities. I came across one study in which they had this um, tracking system that they would place on the teacher's uh, head. And it showed that the teacher spent more attention during um, recess and re recreational activities on black boys with the assumption that they're going to engage in some type of behavior that requires them to be um, reprimanded, you know, whereas um, that didn't happen to other children. There is within our school systems systems in which children are tracked 
into non-rigorous uh, academic outlets versus those who are not of a given uh, race and eth ethnicity um, identification. So again, it's, it's more complex, it's not just one thing. And so I think it's important for us to build bridges with various um, entities, whether they're talking about government or independent school districts. Here we actually um, develop a partnership with the local school district. We already have a health professions high school in the city that attracts students from all across the metropolitan area. However, this school in particular does the same, but there are so many seats that are earmarked for those students who come from their community. The school is situated in a heavily Hispanic, Latino, Latinx community that is also underserved. And so they are given equal access to also aspire to become uh, either uh, a, a physician or pursue public health or a biomedical science um, career. So again, we have to make sure that we provide access to opportunity. They say that talent is everywhere, but opportunity is not. So we have to we have to go to where people are and we have to be invested in their success along the way, not just one point in time. We offer a program and then we track that information and then we offer a similar program for years to come. But are we really invested to see that they move on and they matriculate and are successful. Now, they may not land in medical school, but if they land in business school, that's a success in my book. Um, one program at um, UMBC, in which he's actually retired right now, uh, the president is Dr. Freeman uh, Rabowski. Um, he has created a cluster program there where he invests in students um, from day one, and they go off and they graduate and they get accepted to some of the most prestigious universities in the country. That reminds me of historically white colleges and other minority serving institutions. That's what they do. They invest in their students, even though you may have, you know, something that didn't quite, you know, uh, was seen or perceived in terms of your uh, application materials, they bring you up to speed and make you competitive. They have the highest number of students to go off to pro pro professional schools. So you know what, they're doing something right. We can learn from them in many ways. And by the way, I do appreciate this conversation. I think that it's a very good idea to help like particularly African-Americans get in the STEM fields because I never see them there too often. Not until I came here to UIC though, which is very good. I like to see that we are breaking boundaries and helping to make the world a better place. Thank you for that. And you know, what I didn't mention is there's a cost factor. Many feel they cannot afford to pursue higher education or professional schools. And so we have to make it um, uh, a way for them to uh, know that if you do your part, we can help you. There are some scholarships that you might want to take advantage of. We also have to involve the family because many come from backgrounds in which they're providing for, contributing to the household uh, sustainability. So how do we encourage them? Because again, it is, it is um, a culture that is um, embedded and we have to, again, go to where they are and we have to inform and increase awareness to the entire family that this is also not only a dream but can become a reality. And by the way, I am going to have to leave now, but thanks for giving the presentation. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I appreciate your questions. Oh, and I also got I also got the email uh, for let's see here. I got I got an email in the uh, chat which is um, I'm going to take another screenshot of it if I can find it very fast. Um, here it is. WLRC at UIC.edu. Okay, then. Um, let's see. Can I get in contact with you via their email by chance? You sure can. I'm, you can find me. I'm part of a public institution, so I didn't show that in the slide, but um, it is uh, Colin C4 at UT. HSC SA.edu. It's lengthy. Collins. Just just search me. Google me. Chiquito Collins. You'll find me. UT Health. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, thank and you. You have, uh -huh. you have a fun day. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you. You the same. Okay. We have two more questions. Um, actually three now. 
So I'm going to give them to you all at once, and then you can decide which order you want to um, okay. uh, answer them in. So the first two are related to recruitment. So um, one asks, how can, as medical and dental students, how can they become involved in creating pipeline programs for high school and elementary students? The second question uh, is related to, I think it seems like faculty. So would you share some more about how institutions might go about recruiting um, underrepresented minority faculty um, uh, into medicine and into academic medicine? So those two questions are about recruitment. Okay, uh, all right. The, yeah. oh. The third one more. Uh -huh. And the third question is about the context in which women and women of color, um, uh, physicians, um, medical professionals kind of work. So this is about the resources. It asks you to speak to any resources that are available to survivors of sexual harassment and other forms of violence that happen within medical fields. So are there any models that you have seen that you would recommend? Um, or any initiatives that you think can be taken. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll start with the first one um, and how students can become involved in pipeline programs. I always say um, start inquiring with some of your um, school leaders. Uh, they probably already have things in place that you can probably take advantage of or to offer. Um, ways in which you can contribute so you don't necessarily have to reinvent the wheel see what's already made available. Um, it doesn't require a lot of money initially. You know, in fact, we've created a program called Shades of Success. Um, since we now live in a virtual world, it is cost effective, right? And you can bring together parents in addition to students who have aspirations to pursue um, a biomedical career. Um, but I would say, you know, tap into local experts, you know, within the institution, UIC or um, a neighbor, a neighboring um, uh, community organizations. And most of them would be happy to come and provide a presentation about, you know, what's expected as you apply. How do you write a resume? Um, who should I talk to? You know, sometimes high school counselors or pre-med counselors, I always um, I would say astute as pertains to the grooming of, of, of students who have aspirations in that arena. So, but um, you're in Chicago and you, get, you have such a vast um, number of civic organizations as well as neighborhood organizations in which you can tap into. So it's about having conversation and then you'll find yourself that others may have the express interest as well. And how do you collaborate and then come back to the table um, to um, partner? and leverage what already exists. So the quest, second question as pertains to minority faculty recruitment, um, I would say that um, you have to be authentic in your approach, uh, what I mentioned in my presentation. Um, we cannot assume that people are going to just apply because you put an ad out. And so therefore um, I see a vacancy um, we, again, have to engage in creative approaches, um, even though I was, one would argue, at a very prestigious university. And I took the liberty because, um, again, I, I'm not well versed in all the many specialties that exist in medicine, but we live in a world in which we have access to information at our fingertips. And so I would go through departments, um, you know, yes, we look at sister schools, but you know, that's a bias within itself because we only assume that someone who comes with the training from a school that's comparable to yours and you know that you are, um, that person will have the talent and qualifications, but you know, there are diamonds in the rough. So I would literally scan through departments and see um, where faculty are in terms of their rank see what expertise they bring to the table that, that meet the criteria that we're looking for. And often we'll send them an email. My strategy was that I would send them an email and ask them if they would have an opportunity to talk about advancing DEI. So I didn't even make mention about we're looking to hire. But in that conversation, when they made time with me, 
that's when I approach them and say, you know, by the way, we're looking to fill um, a position, um, et cetera, et cetera. And I've encountered on more than one occasion, I had one woman who actually pulled to the side of the road. Um, and she said she was shocked that my institution would take the time out to call and reach her. And so, you know, it's, it's those little things. I had one guy, he was, he was adamant, he had no interest, but we kept, you know, we didn't, we, we didn't badger him, but we were very diplomatic and we were able to have a conversation with him. And he said, you know what? I will do it. And he applied, um, although he was not the one selected, he's now a dean of a school. Um, but nonetheless, my point is that you have to be creative and you have to be authentic. You have to get those, uh, we had chairs of search committees and I will get them to follow up with conversations. So again, we cannot rest on our laurels but based on our reputation. We have to show that we are authentic in our approach and that we really want you for your talent, not just for a checkbox because you meet a certain criteria um, based on your gender, gender identity, race or ethnicity. So that was my strategy. Now, the third question as it pertains to how do we address sexual and gender harassment? That is a topic that has been elevated at least in the context of the Association of American Medical Colleges, because we know that if we don't address those issues that we're going to um, repeat or um, not um, allow individuals to thrive in a way in which they can be successful. And so we're taking the lead on many other organizations, the National Institutes of Health, for example. If you have a, um, if you're funded by the NIH and you have a, a record of sexual harassment, they now are, are taking your money back. They are withdrawing your funds so that you cannot continue to pursue your research. Because we've heard in the past that if you bring in a lot of money, we turn a blind eye because your contributions as pertains to the, the extra mural funding that you have obtained gives us credibility and it increases our research portfolio. But now I'm just pleased to know that NIH has now um, imposed that. Um, so it's a slow kind of process to see institutions change. I do know this, uh, the National Academies um, have created a task force, um, a consortium to really um, delve into ways in which we can be proactive versus reactive in addressing sexual and gender harassment. We still have a long way to go. And if you, as you heard in terms of the onset of my introduction, Time's up in healthcare. It's now in um, transition in terms of leadership transition. But again, we have to make sure that we make our voices heard in ways in which we begin to change policies, procedures, and processes to ensure that women can be their whole self, authentic self, and not have to um, experience or be the one to um, feel like if I say something, there is the um, propensity of me uh, being retaliated. Okay. Uh, it's, it's um, oh, you guys do telemedicine or is that just you? Oh, good for you. Oh. I think so. <laughs> not realizing, <laughs> that's <Yeah>. okay. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, we have a long way to go is, is my point, you know, until we address it in, um, and a concerted manner and sustain over time, we're still gonna find women who decide not to pursue certain specialties, women who leave the profession altogether um, and all those things. Again, um, it requires a multifaceted approach. Okay. Thank you so, for your- Are there any final last questions for uh, Dr. Collins? If so, if not, I have one. Okay, so UIC is a minority serving institution. Um, like so many universities, uh, we are, our undergraduate student body is majority women. And at UIC, which is particular, it's actually majority of our undergraduate students are women of color across racial and ethnic categories. Half of our students are interested in STEM um, and so that means that a lot of the students who are looking to go into healthcare fields, whether that's nursing, dentistry, pharmacy, uh, medicine, um, are also women of color. 
So this is a very particular uni uh, university space in which to have a conversation about what are the challenges and opportunities for women in academic medicine. So I want to ask you, Dr. Collins, what would you say to these new, brand new undergraduate students who are pushing through, trying to figure out what direction they want to go in? Uh, what would you say to them? Well, what I would say, I would say to the institution, if you've yet to devise a mentoring plan or mentoring program, this is by all means one in which you should develop, right? Um, students learn mostly from their near peers. They're more influenced, I should say, right? So if you are a stage or two ahead of that person incoming into medical school, then you're more inclined to kind of be able to navigate so, some of the pitfalls that he or she may have encountered or they may have countered, right? Um, so think about having a triangular mentoring program where you have incoming students, those who are one or two years ahead of them, okay? And then those who are ahead of them, you know, when you're talking about medical students, M MS1s, MS2s, first year and second year students, then MS3s and MS4s. Now they are more, I would say, hard to track because they're in clinical rotations, okay? But nonetheless, if you have established um, and then partner with residents and fellows, because each stage of the pipeline, you're learning from those individuals and somehow find a way in which a faculty can oversee those efforts, right? Because the goal, although they may opt to, again, pursue private practice, is to bring them in the fold in terms of academic medicine and becoming future faculty members. So I would say um, that has been successful um, in, in, in many institutions. So if, if one has yet to be established there, that's something to um, strongly consider. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let us give Dr. Collins a warm welcome and a warm round of applause. Thank you, I appreciate it. Can you put your cameras on so I can see you? Cause I just see your name. <laughs> Yeah, we've gotten into this habit, but thank you. Fantastic. Again, thank you for the invite. And uh, we can't do this work alone. Um, I can't think of every idea. We lean on our students, like I said before. They are the, um, they keep the fire to our feet to the fire, um, but we learn from each other. And so we have to make sure we create those opportunities to have that exchange. So thank you once again, and I wish you all the best. And if you need any further, guidance or information, Dr. Bennett knows how to reach me, and we'll <laughs> take it from there. Great to see you all. Okay, thank you so much. This was incredibly insightful and inspiring and full of data, like information that we can actually use to actually push for change. So thank you for this. Awesome, next time I'm in Chicago, I'm gonna have to just see you in person, okay? <laughs> yes, for sure, we'll make sure that happens. <laughs> all right, wish you all okay. the best, Thanks. take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thanks to everyone who came out for this event. We're very happy that you were here and looking forward to seeing you again at our next event.